Okay, welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our fourth and final class in our wonderful four-part series on contemporary Jewish issues from the Sephardic perspective. For those who don't know me, my name is Ethan Marcus. I am the Managing Director of the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, the national umbrella organization for the Latino-speaking Sephardic communities in the United States. We're so happy to have you here uh, for this wonderful four-part series that we partner with the Institute of Jewish for Jewish Ideas and Ideals. And of course, the incredible Rabbi Dr. Mark Angel, one of the leading Sephardic rabbis and scholars in our communities. So we're very grateful to participate and lead this four-part series. Just as a reminder, this program is through um, the Sephardic Digital Academy, a beautiful online digital academy hosting Sephardic education through Torah, Halakha, Latino language and culture, Sephardic history, and even some Sephardic food. So if you're interested in learning more about our other programs, please check out our website at SephardicBrotherhood.com slash Sephardic Digital Academy. One last note I will make, we will be sending out a survey, a community survey uh, after the class is over, asking for your feedback to let us know what you thought, how you enjoyed it, and other class ideas you might have in the future. So we can definitely try to improve ourselves and make sure we offer a lot of new programs that are of interest to our community. With that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to the man who needs no introduction. Um, and this is, uh, Kacham uh, for our community, Rabbi Mark the Angel. Rabbi, whenever you're ready, please unmute and the chavod. Thank you very much, Ethan, and good evening to everybody. Uh, today is Yom Yerushalayim. It's a kind of an ominous day. It should be happy. It should be a beautiful day celebrating the reunification of Jerusalem since the 67 war, six day war. But unfortunately, peace is hard to find. And uh, there have been missiles being shot into Israel and riots in Jerusalem. It's been a very difficult time. So before we start our program tonight, let's all pray for a moment for the peace of Jerusalem, for the peace of Israel, for the peace of the whole world. Wouldn't it be nice if everybody would simply say, there's no reason to fight with each other. Let's work together and we can have a wonderful, wonderful life together. But unfortunately, the Mashiach isn't here yet. And uh, we have to struggle day by day to make sure that Israel and the Jewish people and all good people everywhere are sustained. So we pray to the Ribbono Shalom, peace in Israel, peace in Jerusalem, peace for the Jewish people, peace for all good people everywhere. Well, we're going to talk about religion and superstition. And it sounds like they're two different subjects. But in fact, there's a very, very fine line between religion and superstition. Both are metaphysical. Both require a leap of faith. When you have a religion, you believe in God, which can't, God can't be seen. God is beyond us. It requires a certain amount of faith to be able to, to maintain that. Superstition also believes in some kind of supernatural natural powers, but there's a big difference. True religion is we are surrendering ourselves before an almighty God. We recognize God as the all power, and we do our best to live our lives in such a way as to serve God um, in a humane and beautiful and a spiritual way. Superstition, on the other hand, is a little different. Actually, it's a lot different. Superstition is an attempt to control God. It's by saying, if I could only say the right magic formula, or if I could only wear the right red ribbons, or if I could only have the right kind of amulet, I could make God do what I want him to do. And that's not religion anymore. That's superstition. Religion at its best is highly intellectual, requires a lot of thinking, requires a lot of soul searching. It's not the easiest thing to be a religious person. It requires genius, religious genius, requires effort. To be superstitious, anyone can be superstitious. I'm against the eye in Hara, I'm against evil eye. I could go to a, a certain uh, magic wonder worker, pay him off some money, he'll make a blessing for me, he'll make a, a blessing over some whiskey and give it to me and I'll be happy. That's not religion. The ideal of religion in a rational point of view is could be pointed to as the exemplar as Maimonides. In fact, in medieval Spain in general, the uh, medieval Sephardim were famous for their philosophers. Philosophers were people who believed that religion was not something simply to do because you have to do it. You have to do it because you have to think through what it entails. It's the thinking person's religion. Rambam was very emphatic in drawing strong, sharp lines between religion and superstition. And sometimes 
the cases are very, very narrow. Let me give an example. In the laws of Advoda Zara, chapter 11, paragraph 12, he says as follows. Anyone who whispers a charm over a wound and reads a verse from the Torah, or what who recites a biblical verse over a child lest he be terrified, or what who places a Torah scroll or tefillin over an infant to enable him to sleep. These are not only included in the category of sorcerers and charmers, but are included among those who repudiate the Torah. Wow, they repudiate the Torah. What did they do wrong? They took a holy book, the Torah, they took tefillin, they took a mezuzah. Rambam is saying, when you use holy things for superficial purposes, as though they're magic, magic tools, that's not religion anymore. You're repudiating the Torah. He goes as further. They use the words of the Torah as a physical cure, whereas they are exclusively a cure for the soul. The Torah is here to raise us spiritually, to make us think beautifully, to connect ourselves to God. When we do things that degrade that spirituality and kind of turn it into magic, that already says Ramam is a degradation of the Torah. Here's another example, which is very, very amazing. He tells us in the laws of mezuzah, there is a widespread custom to write the word Shaddai on the cover on the outside of a mezuzah. Since it is written on the outside, there's no harm done. On the other hand, there are those who write inside the mezuzah, the names of angels or the names of saintly men, some biblical verses or some charms. These people are included among those who have no share in the world to come. Poor people, they have a mezuzah, a holy object, and they're writing the names of holy rabbis in it. They're writing verses from the Bible. And Rambam says they have no place in the world to come. What is their sin? Their sin is they're taking something holy that's supposed to raise us spiritually and they're degrading it into an amulet. They're turning it into magic. And when you turn something into magic, that's not religion anymore. That's superstition. The Sephardic rabbis of the Middle Ages were very emphatic about the importance of thinking things through and of serving God in purity without having superstitious element. That's part one. Now I want to skip to part two. Part two is this, that there was in Spain, not only a rationalistic school, but there was also a Kabbalistic school. In the 1200s, the Zohar was first published. There was a school of Isaac the Blind in Gerona, Ramban and Nachmanides in the 1200s was a famous Kabbalist. What are the Kabbalists saying? The Kabbalists are saying we can't have a religion that is solely based on rationalism. Religion by its very nature isn't entirely rational, it requires the supernatural. And what do the Kabbalists try to do? They try to find illusions in the Torah by playing with the letters of the Torah, the words of the Torah, some hidden meanings that are transcendent meanings that put us into a more spiritual mindset. Now, on the basis of just looking at it coldly, it's, it's a very fine enterprise. We only run into trouble when the Kabbalah turns into magic also. That's when we run into trouble. So religion, Judaism in particular, has a thinking element, a philosoph philosophical element, it has a practical behavioral, behavior, behavioral element, namely halakha, how we're supposed to behave, what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do. And it also has a Kabbalistic element, which is part and parcel of our spiritual being. And what we need to find is a harmony, a balance among these three components. We have to think straight, we have to act properly, but we have to also have a spiritual insight that puts us in tune with the Almighty to make us feel the presence of the Almighty. After the expulsion from Spain, the Jews went to North Africa, to, to the Ottoman Empire, the Middle East, they spread around. And the situation among Sephardim and Ashkenazim was pretty bad. The world uh, did not appreciate the greatness of the Jewish people. They persecuted us, they put us in ghettos, they didn't give us rights, etc. We all know those sad stories. But something else happened. Within the overall Jewish mind, 
the spirit of rationalism declined and the spirit of Kabbalism expanded. Why is that so? I can't give a full example, but Jews are expelled from Spain, for example. They've been living there for a thousand years. They couldn't understand why they were persecuted. What why did God let this happen to them? To try to explain that rationally, it's not very easy, but we could explain it metaphysically. Abravanel explained that this is the prelude to the messianic era. You're supposed to go through a period of suffering before the Messiah comes. So the, he wrote three books saying the Messiah is gonna come in 1503. That's something people were attuned to. Or you say, right now, it looks like we're losers. It looks like we're being oppressed. But if we just keep the commandments in the way that the Kabbalists teach us, then we are actually touching a connection with God and our lives are meaningful. In spite of what the non-Jews do, in spite of what our persecutors do, as long as we follow our ways and listen to our rabbis and do things our ways, we are going to have favor in the eyes of God and we won't get rewarded in this world, but we'll be rewarded in the world to come. So what happened gradually after the expulsion from Spain, both in the Sephardic and Ashkenazic worlds, by the way, for different reasons, but there was a compression of the Jewish spirit. We had less options, less thinking options, and we became a, what I called a Kabbalistic Midrashic religion. Kabbalah itself is wonderful, the Midrash itself is wonderful. Nothing against either of those things per se. But what are the features of a Kabbalistic Midrashic religion? One, it's authoritarian. Who knows the truth? Only the rabbis. Only the learned sages know the truth. And not only the truth in Torah, they know the truth in everything. And therefore, it's not up to us to think on our own. If we have a question, whether it be a halakha question, a religious question, a moral question, a question about business, whatever it will be, first we should go to the rabbi and consult the rabbi. And the rabbi is supposed to be all wise and able to recognize the genius in each person and to answer exactly the way God would want the, the question to be answered. So one thing is authoritarianism. Another thing is pacifism. Being passive means if we're suffering, it's for our sins. That was a common theme throughout the, certainly the Middle Ages and, uh, and uh, the, from the 1600s to the early 20th century, that was common and still is in some circles. And we said the Musaf on, on the holidays, because of our sins, we're put in, we would put in exile. It's a common idea that we're just suffering for our sins. And what happens when we suffer for our sins is we get cleansed from our punishments. We punish, get punished in this world. And the next world we go, we're, we have all the gravy. We're in good shape there. So it's a passive life. Don't fight your fate, just accept it. So the classic example of this was in the year 1840 when there was a blood libel against the Jews in Damascus and against the Jews of the island of Rhodes. The blood libel is non-Jews make a claim, horrible claim, that Jews took a non-Jewish, a Christian child and killed them and drank the blood and mixed the blood for their matzah. It's a long story, or drank it for the wine. And no matter how crazy and ridiculous these charges were, people believed it. Not only did people believe it, but people beat up Jews, killed Jews. People died over this uh, horrible blood libel. In 1840, this happened simultaneously in both Damascus and in, and in the island of Rhodes. And I could talk about Rhodes because I did some research on that subject. The rabbi and the leaders of the community were put in jail. They were tortured until they would make a confession to say who killed the child and who drank the blood and who mixed up the blood. And none of them would confess. We didn't do it. We're totally innocent. Meanwhile, Moses Matafiori and other important Jews went to the Sultan in, in Istanbul. And the Sultan finally agreed to these charges are false. And he said, I don't want any of my subjects to suffer and the Jews should be released. So the Jews were released. Okay. That happened right around uh, Purim time, Pesach time, before Pesach. And uh, the chief rabbi of Rhodes at that time was Rabbi Michael Yaakov Israel, Great rabbi, very learned rabbi. We have a number of his books, very, very powerful, very learned man. And he gave a sermon after being released from prison. And he told the people, do you know why we suffered this horrible 
the suffering and the torture and the horrible charges against us? Do you know why our community was put in this horrible thing? We speak La Shon Hara. We talk too much in synagogue. He didn't say we're suffering because we don't, we're not strong enough to resist the enemies. He didn't condemn the enemies. He didn't say we should start an anti-defamation league or a Jewish defense league or any other thing to, to stand up for ourselves. No, God is punishing us for our sins. And this is what we should expect. This was a common way of thinking. In fact, when the Zionists first started the idea of Jews coming to their own state, establishing their own land, establishing their own country, many of the most religious Jews opposed it. Why? They said, we should wait till the Mashiach comes. We're in exile as a punishment for our sins. Let us get punished, let us suffer, and then the next world will have all our reward. All of this is wound up in one way or another with a Kabbalistic Midrashic point of view. Some scholars claim, and I think there's truth in it, that the whole Shabbatai Tzavi incident in the 1600s, when we had a false Mashiach, Shabbatai Tzavi, why did so many people follow him? They followed him because they're so mixed up with Kabbalah, they gave up thinking rationally. They didn't uh, demand proofs, scientific proofs, reasonable proofs. They fell for magic, they fell for superstition. If you have an excessive stress on re reason, religion could become very sterile, ad admittedly. Rambam was a great genius. He, he could handle all of being a philosopher, but not everyone's a philosopher. There has to be some kind of heart and soul that goes with it. We're not just brains. We're also total human beings with emotions. So to, be, to demand total rationalism, for the elite few, maybe so. Kabbalah, if it goes to an extreme, also makes us go crazy. It makes us fall for all kinds of superstitious nonsense because someone's a great Kabbalist. Someone gets a reputation of being a great Kabbalist, so therefore he must be able to have um, control over God. If he makes the right blessing for us, we'll be cured from our illness. If he makes the right blessing for us, X, Y, Z can happen. There have been so many cases of fraud in, in recent years of so-called Kabbalists who took huge sums of money promising that the, uh, in one case in Brooklyn a few years ago, he promised a man that his daughter who was not able to have a child would have a child. So the man paid him $100,000 so this rabbi should make a blessing and the, the, the daughter should have a child and the daughter didn't have a child. So the fellow tried to sue the rabbi and the, he couldn't win. The, why, why were you so foolish to give the money in the first place? But this, it happens all the time. Um, there's a famous uh, infamous group that sends out very fancy flyers very regularly. They advertise in the Jewish press, uh, Kupata ear, and they have pictures of all kinds of old rabbis with long white beards. If you'll only send us money, we will go to the Kotel in Jerusalem and we'll make a blessing for you. We'll put a kvittel into the wall, we'll put a little note into the Kotel, and great Sadiqim, we're going to pray for you. And you're, we guarantee that you'll be okay. One of these rabbis, amazingly enough, when the COVID disease pandemic started, he said, it's in writing, I'm not making this up, if you'll only contribute so much money to our organization, I promise you, no one in your family will have COVID. And um, um, thousands of people listen. They, they, they lost their brains. They, they say, a holy rabbi is promising me to be safe, must be true, let me send my money in. In other words, when you carry authoritarianism too far, you also end up with foolishness. When people talk about religion today, what do they think about? Just the popular press. Terrorists who are doing things in the name of God. Extremists, superstitious wonder workers, mega churches, rabbis who get themselves in all kinds of trouble. Who thinks of religion as something beautiful? something worldly, something that thinking people want, something that helps fulfill our soul. That kind of vision of religion, which should be the correct way, uh, approach to religion, we don't see in the, pop, in the popular eye. We see self-serving people. We see power strong, powerful, power hungry people. We see all of the sh weaknesses of humanity in religion, just as we see all the greatnesses of humanity in religion. Religion isn't a cure for things. Religion is a place to hide for many people. 
And so, as I said at the very beginning of this discussion tonight, Judaism in particular, but I think any good religion, essentially is a demand. It's a demand that we, we, we be as best as we can be to measure ourselves, not against anybody else, but to measure ourselves in the eyes of God. There's a transcendent greatness of being way beyond us. And I wanna live up to that standard. Yes, some people will think I'm uh, too, too reasonable, I'm too Kabbalistic, I'm this, that, or the next thing. Put it to the side. I'm not in a contest with anybody. My contest is between myself, my own soul, and the Almighty. That's what I have to work at. I was talking before about authoritarianism, and that's what scares me about uh, contemporary efforts, contemporary patterns within orthodoxy, but it affects the Sephardi as much as the Ashkenazim, I'm afraid to say. The, stre the, the stress on heroes, heroes who are to be worshiped, to be venerated, and to be giving this advice on all subjects. Years and years ago, I met with a Sephardic rabbi, chief rabbi of a city, I won't say his name, but he was a great rabbi, he's passed away since, author of many books, very, very significant human being, and I met with him. And it happened that the person that walked out of his office before I came in was wearing a military uniform. And when I came to the rabbi's office, he said, do you know who that was? I said, no. He said, it was General so-and-so. Oh, very nice. Do you know why he came? Why did he come? He came because he wants me as a chief rabbi to tell all the yeshiva students that they should sign up and serve in the Israeli army. Okay, and you know what I told him? I told him all the soldiers should put down their guns and take up the Gemara and learn Torah. And if the, everyone will learn Torah, God will protect us. And he quotes a pasuk and a midrash to prove that God will protect us if we all study Torah. So I kind of went backwards. I said, Rabbi, are you saying that as, a, as a, a fact or this is your opinion? He says, what do you mean it's my opinion? Of course, if our, if our sages said it's true, then it's, of course it's true. If we will only sit down and study Torah, God will protect us. I said, are you willing to risk the security of the state of Israel to that? He says, but of course, aren't you? I said, no. So he thought it was a, I, I was lacking faith. If our Chachamim have a midrash that says such and such, that's truth. It's not maybe, it's not if, it's the truth. And we were sat in the same room, two rabbis, two Sephardic rabbis, both believing in God, both believing in the Torah, but we might've been in two different worlds. We were in two different fishbowls. What's going on? The answer is that over the course of time within religion, people have learned not to think anymore. To be able to think is a privilege. It's a privilege that God gave us. God gave us reason. God gave us the capacity to think things through and to be independent. To consult a rabbi is wonderful. We should always consult rabbis. Rabbis are wonderful. I'm all in favor of consulting rabbis. But to consult, not just the way you consult a physician or you consult a lawyer, you consult somebody who's an expert in their field, but you don't submit to their decision until you've processed it yourself and come to a conclusion that it makes sense. You don't just do something because someone says you must do it because our sages tell you to do it. Sometimes we have children from our community that have gone to Israel to study in yeshivot. And I'll one case of a young lady who studied in a female yeshiva, he does school for girls, that was supposed to be very open-minded. And in the class, the teacher said, whatever she said, ta-ta-ta. And the student said, but why do we do that? And the teacher responded, Chazal say so. Chazal means our rabbis. Our rabbis of blessed memory said so. Yes, I understand that, she's, the student said, but why did Chazal say so? Because we're not allowed to ask that question. If our sages said it, that's, that's the end of the discussion. That's the truth. So this girl, needless to say, pulled out of the school and came back to New York. She couldn't take that kind of thinking. And I'm, I'm proud of her. She did the right thing. We're, we're not, I get nervous when talking about that from the Sephardic angle now, when Sephardic life or Sephardic culture is presented to the public, more or less as some kind of folk superstitious culture. What do I mean? What's a visible symbol that everyone likes to use for the Sephardim? A Hamsa. Hamsa I think is probably an Arab, a Muslim symbol in the first place. What's a Hamsa supposed to symbolize? A, a, a protection against the evil eye. I don't want to have 
be defined as a culture that lives in fear of the evil eye. I think we're way past that. And I think it might be cute in some way, uh, to t you know, folk way to, to think about those things. But what I'm afraid is that those folk ways sometimes become the way of interpreting the Sephardic experience. The, uh, so I just wanna go back to the beginning again and, and we'll uh, come to a conclusion in a bit, we'll have questions. My great fear is that religion in general, and I include Jew Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, traditional Judaism, and I include Sephardim in that, in that rubric, are getting more and more separated from religion in its truth. There's more effort to become Kabbalistic, mystical, irrational, authoritarian on one side, and the other side, to just leave religion to go altogether. People think if religion is only superstitions and hamsas and evil eyes and magic uh, amulets, that's not for me. And I can't blame them for that. To present Judaism and Sephardic Judaism in particular as a viable way of life that makes us feel better, that enriches us, that makes us stronger, that makes us whole. That's what Judaism is. That's what the Torah is about. And those elements are, are missing. Very often when people envision Sephardic Jewish life in Israel or, or Haredi life in Israel, we just had this recent horrible thing in Meron where 100,000 people gather, where there was only room for 10,000 or so, and 45 people unfortunately got killed in the process. Where, where are the rabbis? Why are people telling them to go to worship at a grave? Why, what, what's, what's happening with people? It becomes a folk, Pack practice, the public becomes uh, swept up in it. It's fun, you go there, you dance, you have fires, it's holy, and there are holy rabbis dancing there. Ladies and gentlemen, don't surrender your brain. Don't give up to these things, don't give in to these things. Years and years ago, I was at a very sad funeral, and uh, I don't want to belabor the point. It was a funeral of a person who was exceedingly not religious. He did almost everything wrong from a Jewish point of view. He was a nice fellow in many ways, but from a religious point of view, he was not one of your, not one of the 39 righteous people of the generation. And it was well known. A rabbi from Israel, a Kabbalist comes to the funeral and he speaks at the, in such terms that you might thought the man who died was Moshe Rabbeinu. Why did he speak in those terms? Because the man was a big donor to the yeshiva. And why was the man a big donor? Because he thought he was buying a portion in the world to come. I'm not religious, but if I give money to that yeshiva full of Kabbalists, then that's my dues. I'm okay then. When I hear a so-called rabbi, so-called Kabbalist speaking like that, the hypocrisy makes me ache. Makes me, it is painful. Judaism is sensible, reasonable, healthy, it makes us better people. The Torah, the commandments are all there to make us live happier, better lives, more moral, more conscientious, more sensitive. The Torah wants us to think. The Torah wants us to evaluate. The Torah wants us to question. The Torah does not want us to be sheep. The Torah wants us to be thinking people. Judaism today has a choice. Orthodox Judaism, traditional Judaism. We could either succumb to this Kabbalistic, Midrashic viewpoint of authoritarianism, passivity, submit to the authority of the, of the Kabbalists and the great sages, or we can demand the right to think for ourselves. Nothing's gonna change, ladies and gentlemen, nothing's gonna change unless the community itself rises to the occasion. I say this often, and I always say it with an inkling of just a little bit of hope, but only a little bit. Because it doesn't, it, most people don't rise to the occasion. Most people say it's not worth the fight. It's not worth the effort. I don't join in the effort. But the fight has to be made, if not for ourselves, for our children and grandchildren and for generations yet to come. Uh, my Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals, jewishideas.org, you should all be members of it or at least register for it. We fight for an intellectually vibrant, compassionate, and inclusive Orthodox Judaism. 
I think this is not a compromised position. I think this is the ideal position of Judaism. A Judaism that is very faithful to, to tradition, but that's also very faithful to ourselves. It believes in God, but also has faith in ourselves. And this is the kind of religion that I think can have relevance and meaning to our children and grandchildren and the generations yet to come. The religion that goes so far to the right, it's not for us. The religion that goes so far to the left, they just fall off the cliff, there's nobody left. Who's gonna maintain the Judaism in a healthy way? Well, look in the mirror and it's up to each one of us to make that decision. I'm gonna stop here and if you have any questions or comments, I'm very happy to, to relate to them. Thank you so much. Um, like I said, if you have any questions or comments, please enter them into the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can. We already have a few questions, Rabbi, so we're going to jump right in. Um, first question, what is the assertion that Rabbi Akiva could derive interpretation based on the crowns on the letters in the, Sephar the Sephardic Torah or the Sephardic Torah, Sephardic Torah? Rabbi Akiva was a very special man. There were actually two schools of thought, Rabbi Akiva's school of thought and Rabbi Yishmael's school of thought. Rabbi Akiva thought that the Torah, since it was the word of God, every letter, every little tag, every little squirrel, squiggle on the letter had metaphysical meaning. And he interpreted things that way. Rabbi Yishmael said, Dibra Torah Adam. Torah was given in the language of human beings. It's a literary document. God is giving us a, a document but he, he said, God gave it to us in a language that we could understand, not that every word has to be interpreted this way and that way and every letter this way and that way. So the difference of schools. But in fact, Rabbi Akiva had that point of view and he prevailed. And to a large extent, modern halacha followed his, uh, his pattern. Is it good or is it bad? It's not relevant. It's, it is, <laughs> that's the way it is. But that's very still different from Kabbalah that I'm discussing. That's not, the Kabbalah has wonderful things about it. Kabbalah has very positive, powerful ways of seeing things we wouldn't ordinarily see. It's important to delve beneath the surface of things, that, to look for hidden illusions and connections. I'm, I'm all in favor of that, that's beautiful. The problem only is when you go away from Rabbi Akiva's clear thinkings on those subjects and veer into what's called superstition. When you turn those things into magic or that I, if I, control the letters of the Torah, or I could say God's name so many different ways, or you can recite this for so many times and something good will happen. That's when Kabbalah veers into superstition and that's when it becomes dangerous for religion. Another question. Among the Roman communities, which are the Greek speaking Jewish communities of Greece that predated the Sephardic world um, in Greece, there was an amulet created at the birth of a baby boy called, uh, called an Aleph which would describe different symbolism and sayings, including the Shema Yisrael, the name of different angels, et cetera, ways to basically protect the baby in his infancy. Um, would you describe this as mysticism or superstition? You ask me, it's, 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 folk, it's folk superstition. All peoples had that, not just the Greek Jews. I'll tell you something. When I was a young fellow at Yeshiva, I used to come, I used to study in New York and I'd go back to Seattle for summers and my mother, who was very rational. She was a very think, good thinking woman. She would get a, go to the garden and pick from our yard. We had a plant called Ruda, Ru. And she would put it in my pocket. Mom, why are you doing that for? Against the evil eye. But mom, you don't even believe in the evil eye. Yeah, but just to be on the safe side. <laughs> she didn't believe in it. She was intellectually, she passed it. But there are folk cultures that, folk traditions that's hard to change. You know, you, people are used to uh, uh, these, these folk things. They used to be uh, in, in many communities um, before the Brit Milah, the night before people would stay up studying Torah, they would be afraid of that, that evil spirits would come into the house to damage the baby. There, there are all kinds of these things. I'm, I'm not here to condemn anybody. Let everybody live and be well. Let everyone believe whatever they want to believe if they want to. But if you want, if I'm writing the book on how people should observe Judaism, I would take those things aside or reinterpret re them and, and create a different kind of ceremony that would keep away from evil eye and demons and things that we don't believe in. How do we expect modern people who are educated people to, to, fall, to go back to primitive times? Didn't we graduate from, from middle ages? Didn't we graduate from times when people believed in witches and demons? Why should we keep those customs? They're, they're just uh, harmful. I mean, I, I shouldn't say harmful. 
they're, they're not helpful. They're not helpful. Next question. Uh, can you take it too far by thinking for yourself? Uh, where does the line, what do you, what do you draw the line? And example, does the case of Korah dispute with Moses fall into that conversation from the Torah? I, I didn't follow the question. Try that again. Sorry. Um, can you uh, swing too far in the opposite direction for thinking for yourself and not relying on, on some mysticism or some sense of, of Kabbalistic elements in the world? The example being when like, the example given by the by the questioner is where does the Korach dispute with Moses fall into this kind of conversation? Of, there, of course, there are boundary lines. We have boundary lines. I wrote, wrote an article once on, on exactly that subject. It's, it's on our website, there, um, jewishideas.org. That we have great great deal of intellectual freedom, but there are certain things, certain points beyond which we can't go. We can't say there is no God. We can't be, we're not atheists. We, we can't cross certain lines. And yes, there, there, are, there are certain limitations to our beliefs. Uh, what I think happens with Korach, by the way, Korach gets maligned. He was a bad guy. I'm not saying he was good, but he gets maligned more than he deserves these days. Why? People, anyone who disagrees with you, they say, ah, he was Korach. <laughs> they right away assume if anyone has an opinion other than the established opinion, they say he's a Korach as though you're out beside the camp. You have no right to voice your opinion. Everyone has a right to voice an opinion. It could be a wrong opinion. It could be a terrible opinion. Voice it, discuss it, argue it, and then you find the truth. But you don't tell people, keep quiet, don't, give, don't have an opinion. Obviously, if we're working within a religious system, we know that there are certain general boundaries. But within those boundaries, there's room for asking and learning, room for learning. And once we quell the quest for learning and for questions, we're done. We become fossils, we become sheep. And once we have a religion of sheep, it's not healthy, folks. It's not healthy at all. Next question here. What is the rabbi's opinion on the wine and scripture quotes after Habdalah? Would you classify that as superstition or mysticism? What wine... Uh, Quotes are you talking about? I'm clear from the question posed here. The Havdalah that I say has quotes from the Bible, but those are only quotes that uh, have nothing to do with superstition at all. They're quotes of happiness, they're quotes that God uh, should, should give us strength. They're, they're not, there's no, nothing superstitious about those verses. If I use those verses, going back to Maimonides, if I would take a verse and say, I'm using it on condition that I'm going to control God, and if I say this verse, God will then make my week more prosperous, my stocks will go up, that's superstition. But if I'm simply saying words of the Psalms, uh, I'm saying uh, beautiful verses from the Bible that strengthen me and make me happy, say all the verses you want. See, the Ramam also, let me go back again. Let's say somebody, because the widespread custom, if someone's sick, the people say to heal him for that person, right? It's a widespread custom. So is that religion or is that superstition? Okay, good question. That's a very good question. So Rambam would define it as follows. If I'm saying the Psalms on condition that I'm gonna be able to manip manipulate God to make him feel sorry to have mercy on this person's sickness, that's superstition. If I'm saying Psalms saying, God, in the merit of my saying the Psalms and praying to you, I hope you bring a refuah to the person who's sick. I'm not making it contingent. I'm not saying I'm using these Psalms in, as a magic way of controlling you to force you to cure this person. I'm saying I'm behaving in my such, such and such a way. I'm saying these verses, not as magic, I'm saying as prayers. I'm, I'm reaching out to God to help. That's okay. I think the person clarified just now by saying, um, he was referring to the Sephardic tradition in some communities, taking some of the wine and putting it on your forehead and behind your neck as a superstition or versus mysticism. That's not a superstition. I, I call that symbolic behavior. Superstition, the way I use I, if a person just does these things and some people have a custom of laughing when they have Havdalah, there are different customs or they, they take the, 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 uh, the fire and they dip it into the wine. Those things are customs. There's, there's a harmless, they're okay, they're fine. The only time it becomes superstition is if you think by doing those things, you're warding off an evil eye or you're controlling God, then it becomes superstition. Maybe just do it because it's quaint, it's cute, it's nice, it's a, it's a symbol of happiness. Put all the wine you want on your cheeks, it's fine. 
a question here. I, um, I grew up in a very superstitious environment in Turkey. My father, may rest in peace, blames Kabbalah both for the superstitiousness and for the Shepatai Svi debacle. Was he right? Bless your father, he had it right. <laughs> yes. It, I, I don't know 100% if it caused a Shabbatite to be debacle, but it was a contributing factor. People learned to be, to forfeit their own thinking. And those people who were, who were more reasonable, they got persecuted. They were, they, were, they were punished. The masses become hysterical. And if you were, re, if you were reasonable at that time, you, you were suffered for it. The Kabbalah in general, I, I want to go back to this. I'm not anti-Kabbalah. All the, I think almost all the great Sephardic Chachamim of all the generations, including Rambam, by the way, in his own way, had a very keen inner spiritual sense. They felt the presence of God. Religion wasn't just what you do and what you don't do. It wasn't what you think and what you don't think, but there was a real piety to it. Among the Moroccan Jews, they had a famous rabbi who died some years ago. They called him the Baba Sali. The Baba Sali, he might be called a wonder worker according to some. But what does Baba Sali mean? It's not a name. Baba Sali means our father who prays. And that, that's what the many Sephardim had that in the, in expected of the rabbi. A rabbi has to be able to pray. A rabbi has to be able to feel a connection between himself and God, or in this days, between herself and God. There has to be something spiritual. So the Kabbalah itself lends something of power to our religious life. It only goes crazy when it becomes uh, superstitious, when it becomes magical and far-fetched, or when it becomes, you must believe this nonsense because Rabbi XYZ said so. Then we, then to, that's what we, we part company with people who think that way. A question from the chat. How do we deal with kind, well-meaning individuals who try to advise prayer at uh, the tombs of deceased rabbis um, in our synagogues? Do we confront them or do we simply politely keep quiet? Say that again, but I didn't hear the question. The question was, how do we uh, address or deal with um, kind and well-being uh, members of the community who will advance their prayers by going to the caves of deceased rabbis? Do we, do we confront them or do we let them be? We let them be. The Talmud itself has a discussion in the, in the tractate Ta'anit about people going to the cemetery. It was an old custom. Um, people went to the, to the cemetery before Rosh Hashanah, before uh, any other occasions, and the Gemara doesn't condemn it. The Gemara says there, two, there were two reasons given why people go to the cemetery, or when people are fasting, when there was a famine, people would go to the cemetery and, and pray at the, at, the, at the cemetery of the righteous. Or... So one, one explanation the Gemara gives is, we go there to say, God, we're just as dust, we're humble, we're going to be dead like these people, have mercy on us. So we're mortal, we're just innocent human beings. Please bring rain, please forgive our sins. Please let us live good lives. That's reason one. Reason two is we go to them, we pray to their souls that they should intervene to God, that God should have mercy on us. When Ramam takes us down these laws, he takes point number one. In other words, when we go to, to the cemetery, it's not to ask this dead person to pray for us, but it's on the merit of this person, this person's righteousness, person's goodness. We wish we could be that good. Almighty have mercy on us. We're not manipulating God. We're using the grave to inspire us to be better or to have God look more mercifully upon us. It's not done as a magical way. Nevertheless, some people still shy away from going to cemeteries for that reason, but many people do, and it's not worth fighting with them for over it. I mean, I don't. I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't cross my mind to do it. But those who do it, they do it. Another question here. Um, is it okay to say things like, mashallah, cuadrado de ayin hara, which means, you know, may God, you know, protect us from the ayin hara, or knock on wood, or should we stop saying those types of things? <laughs> knock on wood, we certainly shouldn't say, because that's really a Christian symbol. It's like knocking on the cross, the wood of the cross. That's, certainly we shouldn't say that at all. Knock on wood. <laughs> no, don't say that. Um, mashallah, I say mashallah myself. What does mashallah mean? In God's will, let it be God's will. There's nothing wrong with saying let it be God's will. And you say mir Hashem in Hebrew, or you know, let it, uh, God willing, this just means the same thing. If you say, against evil eye, 
okay, that's a little bit more fussy, but also it depends. Many people say that they don't mean that there's really an evil eye. They don't believe that there really is a demon that's gonna hurt people. But they believe it's, they don't want you to get hurt. They don't want people to say bad things about you. They want you to feel good. So they say it, so they don't mean any harm. So I wouldn't stop them from saying it. If they really believed that by my saying this or by wearing this armor that I put this ruler in my purse, in my pocket, I'm gonna really uh, keep demons away from me, that's a problem. But most people these days don't believe that anyway. They do it for fun. Question here, referencing back um, what you mentioned before about the, the, the woman, the, the girl in the yeshiva. If we ask a question and a rabbi or a teacher in school tells us that we cannot ask that question, or is it inappropriate? What is the appropriate response in your opinion? I gave you my appropriate response. The appropriate response, the appropriate response is if I can't ask the question, Rabbi, you're shutting, you're making a wall between yourself and me. I have to be able to discuss it. You can tell, explain why I'm wrong, why, what I should understand. But if you don't give me a chance to express myself and ask my questions, there's nothing to learn. We have um, in the Pirkei law by Shan Lamed, the person who's too shy doesn't learn because they don't ask. But also as law Kaptan Malamed, the one who's too strict can't be a good teacher because they don't listen to the questions of the students. There has to be a flow back and forth of questions and answers and discussion. And um, when people are used to being authoritarian, they don't like wise guys asking them questions. And it's very tough to be a student, a teenage student and come against a 30 or 40 year old teacher or older and tell them that they should uh, behave themselves. But they could complain to the head of the school. They could say, I had this inter interaction, which is negative and I, I, I need to ask my question, I need to learn. So I, I, my best, the best teachers I ever had in my life were teachers that gave us a chance to ask and to answer and to criticize and be criticized and gave us a free reign. Those are the best teachers I had. Um, someone just has a question regarding a bit more um, clarification. If you can clarify and say more explicitly the difference between the real mysticism or religious practice and superstition, because in his view, Judaism is a lot of physical acts that doesn't have a rational explanation. And his example he is, is shaking the Arba Minin. Okay, the Arba Minin, let's, let's, let's go to that. That's very fine. The, the Torah commands us to take these four species of uh, vegetation and we shake them on, on, uh, on Sukkot. Okay. Open and shut. The Torah doesn't give us any reasons why we do it, why we don't do it. So since we all have creative minds, we think of what reasons are there? So the, the Gemara gives reasons. Uh, one represents a heart, one represents an eye, uh, one represents the unity of the Jewish people, one's a righteous one, one's not the righteous. Everyone gives explanations. And that's fine. There's, we should give explanations. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. When you say, I have to take this new love and move it exactly this way because the Kabbalah says, if I don't do it this way, I'm not impacting on the spiritual, the angels above. Uh-oh, that's already crossing a line for me. Well, the, the actual misvah that we have, the commandments are commandments. They're black and white, they're pretty clear. And they're usually very reasonable explanations one could give for them. As soon as you start having explanations, we do this because the, uh, we affect the angels or we do this because we control God, that's already crossing the line. Okay, with that, that looks like all the questions we have for this evening, um, which is wonderful. We, I think we exhausted the list, which is great. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for this thing, especially thank Rabbi Angel so much. If you just noted, I just put into the chat a class survey. So if you've been around for us, either this class or the class before, please take a look at that survey. It takes about five minutes, fill it out, give us some feedback. We'd love to hear from you. We really greatly appreciate it. And we'll also send it out via email as well. I want to take a moment again to thank Rabbi Angel so much for this wonderful four-part series. And also thank our partners. Um, he is the director of the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals, a wonderful institute who we're very proud to partner with to make sure all these kind of vibrant and diverse thoughts about Judaism, particularly from the Sephardic perspective, are valued and learned from. Um, I want to thank you all for participating. Inshallah, we'll be back again soon enough with Rabbi Angel. And Rabbi Angel, again, thank you so much um, for spending the time with us these past few weeks. We really greatly appreciate you all. it. And uh, happy Yom Yerushalayim, and don't forget to count the Omer tonight. Absolutely.
Rabbi, thank you so much. And thank you all and wish you all a good evening.